Luke 13. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You will all likewise perish. Praise God. Welcome to Battle Cry Sounding, Battle Cry Pounding. And you know it's regretful that God has to pound the battle cry. It's regretful that God's people over the last 30-something years have refused to hear the battle cry sounding. And now it's come to the point where God is demonstrating the battle cry pounding. But you know, if we will learn to be responsive to God through repentance by continuing in repentance, then we don't need to be pounded, but we can simply hear his voice and obey. In other words, when he sounds the battle cry, in any given instant or instance or circumstance, we can respond favorably unto him and obey him. Because that's what God wants is an obedient people. And that's what God intends to bring forth. Now, each of us in this walk with God has responsibility and accountability. And if we lose out with God, we can't go around and blame everybody else. But we have to come to the place of thorough and deep and complete repentance before God in order to gain restoration. Now the name of today's message is Repentance to Restoration. If we want to be restored to that place of favor with God the Father, then we need to repent. And not just a boo-hoo drunkard's repentance, you know, I'm sorry, and then five minutes later, or an hour later, or two days later, do the same thing again. But a real revelation as to the fact that if we are left to ourselves, we are ultimate wickedness. But if we remain in God, then we can be blessed by God and covered by God and have the cup of mercy rather than the cup of wrath. Now today, in this teaching, we're going to Luke chapter 15, if you'll turn there with me. And I'm reading out of the Amplified Version. Now this is so good. It's just so full of truth, and it's so full of light, and it's so full of instruction. And yes, we've read the chapter before, Luke 15. And as I say at the market when I'm preaching, that's found in the New Testament portion of the Holy Bible. So, in Luke 15... It's um, Jesus giving demonstration through these parables, stories, whatever you want to call them, that he's telling how it is that things are in his kingdom and what it is that God respects and what it is that God abhors. So beginning here, I'm going to go before we get to the major text. We're going to start in about, um, well, we'll go in verse 3. It says, so he told them this parable. And that's because the Pharisees and scribes were muttering and indignantly complaining, saying, this man accepts and receives welcomes preeminently wicked sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, if he has a hundred sheep and should lose one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness desert and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his own shoulders rejoicing. And when he gets home, he summons to go together his friends and his neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep which was lost. Thus I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one especially wicked person who repents changes his mind, abhorring his errors and misdeeds, 
and determines to enter upon a better course of life than over 99 righteous persons who have no need of repentance. Or what woman having 10 silver drachmas, each one equal to a day's wages, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and look carefully and diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she summons her women, friends, and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the silver coin which I had lost. Even so, I tell you, there is joy among and in the presence of the angels of God over one especially wicked person who repents, changes his mind for the better, heartily amending his ways with abhorrence of his past. Sins. Let them sing for joy on them. So Jesus is giving them right there those two examples of the joy that comes from true repentance. In other words, that which is lost is found, and that which is strayed is restored. So he's manifesting to them through the telling of these two little excerpts or stories right here that there is joy in heaven when the wicked repent, okay? And the reason that he's giving them that understanding is because they're accusing him, the Pharisees and the scribes, are accusing Jesus because of what? Because he is reaching out to the sinful, to the lost, to the dying, the perishing, and he's offering unto them the way of mercy, and they're mad about that. They're mad about it because they want to keep their religious domination forever and ever. They're mad about it because he is reaching out through the compassion of the heart of God and they can't stand that. Hmm? They're mad at that because he is basically showing that as the good shepherd he goes out for the lost. He goes to bring the lost into the flock. In other words, he's the one that goes through the effort to look for the lost and they don't even care about the sheep. Lost, found, all around, dead, you know, in hell, they don't care. All they care about is their religious activity and their religious pride, which they strive to keep in the utmost seat in the synagogues. Hmm? So as we go farther into this chapter, beginning here in verse um, 11, it says, And he said, There was a certain man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the part of the property that falls to me. And he divided the estate between them. And not many days after that, the younger son gathered up all that he had and journeyed into a distant country. And there he wasted his fortune in reckless and loose from restraint living. So, of course, we know from the KJV that this was the prodigal son. We know that this individual demanded of his father his share of the inheritance. Then he took it and he wasted it completely in riotous living. Hmm? He wasted it in drinking, he wasted it in, in uh, vile companions, he wasted on loose women, he wasted probably in gambling and probably the use of drugs if they had them in his day, which they've always been around. He just wasted it. And he himself was wasted in the process. Hmm? Now, you wonder, why was this son such a fool? Why did he choose to take such a route and why is it that he was so demanding of a share of the inheritance and then he was just burning with lust to use it all up? It's because he was probably very proud. He was probably waiting from the time of childhood to the time that he could be his own boss. Huh? When I grew up, they used to put that on uh, matchbook covers, be your own boss. To appeal to the rebellious, to appeal to the independent, to appeal to the, pro the, the ones who were full of pride. You can be your own boss. Well, I got news for you. You're never your own boss. Either God is your boss or the devil is your boss. So choose your boss and you'll get the wages of the same. Hmm? 
But, you know, it was a delusion that little kids reading matchbook covers could dream about, be your own boss. But this is what this younger son apparently had spent his time involving his thought life in was the day when he could get away. Get away from his father's house. Get away from his father's rule. Get away from his brother. Get away from those things that weren't exciting. Get away from the dull routine of working and supporting yourself and paying your bills and paying your way. Oh, what a drag. Hmm? What an ultimate drag. I mean, this is like out to lunch, Dad. I'm getting out of here. Little know-it-all. Huh? Little know-it-all. He probably scoffed his father. He probably mocked his brother. He probably just imagined himself to be the best dancer, the best drinker, the best womanizer, the best gambler. What goals in life? Huh? So the little brat, who was by then a big brat, demanded of his dad his share. Then he went and got a share, and after he got it, he was burning with lust to show his stuff. Hmm? To let everybody see that man about town was no longer going to be around in this podunk place, but he was going to the city. Huh? You know how many country bumpkins go to the city only to get wiped out, wasted, disillusioned, pathetically in despair to the point of suicide? Many of them commit suicide. Why? Because the glitter of the lights, the call of the street, the fantasy of the life of vanity are always there for every generation. And the city cesspool was calling this young man to his greatness. <laughs> Actually, he was very deluded. And you know, when you listen to demons, I don't care who you are, and I don't care who your father is, you're going to be deluded. Hmm? Now, the father, I'm sure, was a reputable man. I'm sure that he had established himself in the community that he lived in, that he was able to take care of himself, to take care of his family, to provide for them. Obviously, he was, because he had an inheritance that was to be left to his son upon his death, and then young stuff had to get his early because he was so great so his father i'm sure was a respected man in his community and yet it didn't matter because when young stuff lent his ear to the devil he knew it all when you start thinking you know it all guess what you need to repent now don't forget we're in repentance revolution and that means that we are to revolt against the works of darkness. We are to revolt against sin. We are to revolt against the suggestions of the devil. Okay, when he says, hey, city stuff, why don't you come on over? Tell him, why don't you shut up and die where you're at? Let your face hit the concrete and your teeth in the asphalt and lay there in your own slime. Hmm? I've been to a few cities. I've seen people laying in their own slime. And it's ugly. Huh? Okay. So we got here little know-it-all, who's now big know-it-all, all decked out in his fancy clothes. Not many days after that, the younger son gathered up all that he had and journeyed into a distant country and there he wasted his fortune in reckless and loose from restraint living. And when he had spent all he had, a mighty famine came upon that country, and he began to fall behind and be in want. So he went and forced, glued himself upon one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed hogs. What do I say about that there? is when we go to the world, when we are meant to be in the kingdom of God, we are no better than this boy or this young man. Because it's like you throw yourself 
upon the world and say, okay, I've made a mess, I've refused to repent, I refuse to walk in honor of my father, in honor of my brother, I refuse to do what was right, I know everything, and now I've been made a fool, now you take care of me. How many Christians end up on welfare? How many Christians end up on uh, SSI? How many Christians?